The alumni check in at Rexall Place before heading downtown for a lunch hour ceremony at City Hall. For most of these guys, this is the first time they've pulled on an Oilers jersey in many years. Sad, happy, all the emotions that will be coming tonight for everybody. Uh, a lot of uh, people that put the uniform on, a lot of people that work for the team, a lot of fans that have been here from, from day one uh, when it first opened there. It'll be uh, quite an evening. How are you doing, man? Good. Good. You know, there's been planning going on for a number of months within the organization, and uh, so pleased at the, you know, what's happened so far, so pleased at the, uh, the response by the alumni to come here. They're all really excited. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. How have you been doing? Yeah, good. Doing good. So? Yeah, well, I'm kind of following your team. I was in Vancouver all year this oh, year. Oh, cool. And then uh, I got picked up on waivers here. So yeah, remember, yeah. For the players, no return to this rink would be complete without a trip to the dressing room. This dressing room's a lot different than it used to be. I, I, I'm just amazed by, by the space that they have here and all the equipment. It's so much more technical than, than uh, when, when I used to play. What is this room? <laughs> we didn't have any weights. We didn't think that was our problem. What's a push-up? <laughs> they had five TVs. We didn't even have one. Did we? <laughs> Uh, right up there somewhere. Right there. Right up there. That's a youngster for sure. Uh, that was unreal. Philadelphia, seventh game. Uh, it's crazy. This whole day, this whole thing is crazy. To see all these players again is just amazing. Do you need proof of these? Yeah, it looks like there's other there. right here. Beside Doug Wait, I think myself, Yuri Swagger, Paul Scorson, Freddie O. Good memory, eh? Bryson, when, you, when I don't did remember you... what years I was here. I was there that year? 95, 90, it should be. 93, 94 for sure, 94, 95. Well, what about this one? When did, when did you get traded? I was gone by then. So do I. Yeah. That's the end of the season, I'm not there. Chipping, chipping. Actually, did, did we have lockers, guys, back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't you know what, I can't even remember. That used to be the way from the locker. They told me that. This room you had to walk by, walk by the coach's office, walk into the locker room, quickly walk by as quick as I could, and just stay out of trouble. It's really nice. It's unreal. <laughs> unreal. Is it like this when you were here? No. Hell no. No. Okay. This is unbelievable. This is like first class all the way. Wow. Yeah. Not even, not even close. Yes. <laughs> not even close. Yeah. It wasn't that long. It wasn't that long, but it just shows you how quickly times change, the times fly. And this is what they have in the old building. Imagine what they have in the new building. My first stall was in a chair. Yeah, I remember that. And I was so excited Quite to be sitting in that chair. Yeah. yeah. I was so excited to be sitting in that yeah. chair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, this is great. <laughs> Thank you. This looks very familiar to 1984 when we were doing the same thing, celebrating our first Stanley Cup. Someone asked me today about Northlands Coliseum. I said it's amazing that a, a building can actually have a personality and, and become uh, larger than life, the way it galvanizes the city in so many ways. While the excitement continues downtown, Rexall Place waits quietly. It's an extraordinary day, but the building's veteran staff still have to carry out all the ordinary game prep and maintenance. But uh, thank you to the fans and the media 
and uh, the city of Edmonton. in that building over the years. I want to thank Northlands and I want to thank uh, the folks who've run that building, who've made the ice, who've labored to make it one of the best places to play hockey anywhere in the world. So let's give our respect to that building and the people who ran it. Sad. It's the end of an obviously an era. I've met some fantastic people here, and it's just hard to say goodbye to the building. Get this game done, get everything put away, and then think about it. As you can see, we've got 30 seconds on the clock here. Start. There you go. Clock's gone. What was it, like 71 or something? Edmonton Exhibition Association turned into Northlands. So these were bought before then. We don't throw nothing out. This button here that says horn makes the horn go. It's a nice bit of simplicity in a confusing world. Putting out TVs for the for the bench. So they can see uh, uh, replays, like truck feeds. just helps the coaches get replays in. Anything we do to our bench, we have to do to the visiting bench. So, just doing the visiting bench now. So while I was doing interviews at 10-15, uh, <laughs> just saw Fernie. Good to catch up, see some good faces, good people. People you went to work with every day for a few years. scoreboard or Rexall Place. These are all the panels and the power supplies and addressing cards that you see here. And just doing a couple of quick repairs before the final game here. It's been a lot of years, over 10 years, I've been repairing and maintaining the screen and it's it for me today. Last time I'll be inside here. <laughs> That's perfect. Last time. Last call, bro. Yeah, I don't know. All right. They go tonight. Yes. Yeah. I'll try. They go yeah. away. Congrats. <laughs> the Oilers' final home game of the season. Pitch them against the Canucks. The points count, so both teams will need to be ready by puck drop. That's good, Josh. Uh, good. The Oilers' social media team stream updates throughout the day. It's something that didn't exist when this building first opened. This day is going to be crazy, man. This day is going to be nuts, but it's going to be awesome, I think. It's getting near showtime. <laughs> Last minute production details Kevin are carefully start. reviewed. All right, doors open just over an hour.
the beach ball, but that's the whole sea up there. So we're getting you ready for the night. There you go. Good evening, everybody, and for the very last time, a big welcome from Rexall Place, home of the five-time Stanley Cup champions, the Edmonton Oilers. Vancouver Canucks are in town tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, your Edmonton Please join us in welcoming, representing all of the event staff who deliver your Oilers game experience, a gentleman who will be sitting behind the Rex Allfights microphone one final time this evening after 35 years of announcing all those memorable goals, Mark Lewis. Representing four decades of Oilers office staff, a member of the Oilers ticket department for over 25 years, Sheila McCasco. Representing the staff from Northlands who have served you since 1974, an usher here in Rexall Place for 42 years, Miles Poliak. <laughs> Representing the media and broadcast personnel who covered the Oilers with three dowels in 542 games behind the mic, Hall of Han Hall Representing the executive of the Oilers, the man behind the NHL's first ever outdoor game, and club president for 15 years, Patrick LaForge. <laughs> Representing the most loyal and passionate fans in all of hockey, an Oilers season seat holder since the WHA, who's rarely missed a game in four decades, Margaret Mrazek. Representing the Oilers coaches and trainers. He's one of the most celebrated equipment managers in the history of hockey, having excelled at his craft for over a quarter century with the Edmonton Oilers. Five times Stanley Cup champion, Barry Stafford. 30 year employee of the Oilers in both business and hockey operations and a part of the 1988 and 1990 Stanley Cup championships. Representing all of the players who pulled on an Oilers jersey and stepped on this very ice. Will you please welcome the very first man selected by the Alberta Oilers in the 1972 WHA General Player Draft, Val Fontaine. And finally, representing the ownership history of the Oilers, a man who twice led major initiatives to keep the Oilers here in Edmonton, including recruiting investors for and eventually becoming chairman of the Edmonton Investors Group, Cal Nichols! At this time, we would like to call on the captain of the Vancouver Canucks, Henrik Sedin, and Taylor Hall from your Edmonton Oilers to join our very special group as Cal Nichols drops the ceremonial face-off puck. and join in the singing of our national anthem one final time at Rexall Place with Oilers legend, Paul Orio.
As one big performance gets underway, the needs of the next one are being readied in the wings. Quick shot by Yakupov, he scores! Well, you know it had to come. Yakupov, and it was just right back. Puck came to a stick. That was a beautiful shot. And Edmonton, in the final game here, will take a 1-0 lead. I kind of emotional actually. it around in there now well on the power play in front score dry cycle just jumped on the puck and whipped her home lots of goals an edmonton win and one last salute to the fans it's a fitting goodbye to rexall place from this year's team Now, it's time for the final act. The ultimate curtain call. Hurry up, guys. Let's get those jerseys on. To 42 years of memories. It's not chaos. It's controlled chaos. Yeah. fun than we do. No, no, no. What? It's a 
Adams and you're behind Dan Smith. Dan Smith, Dan Smith. There's Ray Cote. Ray Cote. Ray Cote. I need the players here. I need the current players here. Barry Moore, Barry Moore, Wayne Zook. Okay. Awesome, man. This is scary. Never see this again. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to Rexall Play Slice, number 34, Fernando Pisani! Number 21, Number 24, Danny Ernst. A two-time Stanley Cup winner, number 19, Willie Lindstrom. Number 23, Corey Cross. Winner of two Stanley Cups, number 29, Rejo Rutschelina.
Number six, Ryan Flynn. Number 11, Barry Long. Number 15, Kevin Primo. Number 31, Eddie Mio. Number 28, Bill Hewer. Number 19, Marty Reasoner.
assistant coach, Billy Moore. Number 77, Perry Anker. General Manager, Peter Cervelli.
Number 26, Wayne Maloa. Number five, Mark Fane. Number 41, Bill McDougal. Number six, John Hughes. Number 10, Ron Anderson. Number 51, Anton Leiter. Number eight, Wayne Van Dort. Number 29, Louis DeBrus. Number 26, Aero Pacarina. Number 28, Todd Struby. Number 33, Scott Pearson. Number 34, Ryan McGill. Number 88, Brandon Davidson. Number 16, Darcy Hornachuk. Number four, Kerry Ketter. Number 34, Mike Ware. Number one, Peter A. Number 36, Dennis Buckby. Number 29, Steve Passmore. Number 15, Jim Nielsen. Number 17, Scott Thornton. Number 36, Brad Wareka. Number 10, John Roger. Number one. Number 15, Greg Harwood. Number 38, Jeff DeLaurier. Number 67, Benoit Pouliot. Number one, Joaquin Gage. Number eight, Stu Kulak. Number 18, Danny Gage.
Number 18, Bob McNeely. And number 23, Ted McNeely. Number 25, Mike Moeller. Number eight, Doug Friedman. Number 10, Mayor Yankopar. Number 43, Jason Shredwick. Number 27, Frank Beaton. Number 26, Sean Pogey. Number 44, Zach Cassian. Number 62, Eric Reiber. Number 15, Frederick Olison. Number 27, Adam Trempton. Number 40, Fred Brathwaite. Number 11, Skip Crate. Number 86, Nikita. Number 14, Jordan Everly. Number 30, you see Martinez. Number 6, Ian Herbert. Number 32, Matthew Garron. Number one, Laurent Rossois. A Stanley Cup winner, number 28, Larry Melnick. Number eight, Gord Sherman. Number 15, Steve Ray. Number 22, Adam Cracknell. Number 19, Boy Debro. Number 42,
number 30, Ron Lowe. A Stanley Cup winner, number 13, Ken Lynchman. Number 55, Mark Latestu. A Stanley Cup winner, number 25, Jeff Smith. The head trainer, Ken Lowe. The equipment manager, Barry Stafford. Equipment manager, Lyle Sparky Kochiski. Team doctor, David Reed. Team physiotherapist, Dave McGee. Cup winner number 20, Martin Jelena. Number six, Adam Purdy. Number 18, Kirk Bulkby. Number 21, Stan Weir. Number four, Taylor Hall. A Stanley Cup winner, number seven, Mark Land. Number five, Doug Hicks. Number 37, Dean McCammon. Number 82, Jordan Osterley. Winner of three Stanley Cups. Number 28, Craig Muni. Number two, Andre Sekera. Number 32, Scott Ferguson. Winner of two Stanley Cups, number 33, Marty McSorley. Number 26, Mike Krushomiski. Number 23, Sean Brown. Number 97, Connor McDavid. Number 16, Pat Hughes. Number 18, Brett Callaghan.
number nine, Ross Perkins. Number 14, Blair P.J. McDonald. Winner of two Stanley Cups, number 27, Dave Samanko. Ron Chipperfield. Number 20, Steve Carlisle. Number 8, Griffin Reinhardt. Number eight, Val Fontaine. Number 23, Matt Hendricks. Number 27, Georges Lara. Winner of two Stanley Cups, number 30, Bill Ranford. Winner of two Stanley Cups, number 20, Dave Lovely. A Stanley Cup winner, number 85, Peter Klima. Number 93, Ryan Nugent Hopkins. Winner of five Stanley Cups, number four, Kevin Lowe. Number 94, Ryan Smith. <laughs> Number three, Al Hamilton. Winner of five Stanley Cups, number 31, Grant Fuhr. Winner of three Stanley Cups, number seven, Paul Coffey. Winner of five Stanley Cups, Number 17, Yuri Curry. Winner of five Stanley Cups, number nine, Grand Anderson. Winner of five Stanley Cups, number 11. Mark! Mark.
winner of four Stanley Cups, number 99, Wayne Gretzky. To take us through tonight's Furball Rexall Place celebration, the gentleman who started his career in 1980, working 25 years as the owner's vice president of public relations, highly respected in the National Hockey League for his professionalism and sincerity, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Chuelli. I know. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. What, a, what an incredible sight. A sea of orange. Is that not unbelievable? What a night. Thank you. You know, we often hear that sports teams are like families. And this incredible reunion proves one point. Like most families, we rejoice at each other's successes. We share the pain of our failures. Our hearts are broken when a member of our unique clan passes away. And so even on this evening of celebration, we pause to remember those people, whether they contributed on or off the ice, we'll always recognize the fact that once you are an oiler, you'll always be an oiler and an important part of our family.
all you've been sitting here very patiently. We had a wonderful hockey game. It's time to hear from some of the players who have proudly worn the Oilers logo over the last 30 or 40 years. Let's meet our official on-ice reporters. Firstly, a gentleman who produced Oilers TV for years, was the Executive Vice President of Programming and Production for the NHL. He won an Emmy Award as a producer of hockey broadcast for NBC coverage of the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City and is now a Rogers Sportsnet on-air personality. Please welcome John Shannon. John. He's going to be joined by one of the nicest men in hockey. I first met him when he was a videographer with CFRN many, many years ago, back in the 80s, and he now entertains us with his rather unique approach to hosting the hockey broadcast. Here's the Prince of Puns, Gene Principe. My chance to go first, and I get to talk to the first man who scored a goal in the National Hockey League on a Saturday night in October of 1979 against the Detroit Red Wings, Blair McDonald. Blair, welcome. Oh, hey, isn't this awesome? You played in uh, this building enough times to know that it was home. When you came back, what did you think today and what did you think the last couple of days? Well, this event has just been just out of this world. I mean, I mean, look at this place. It's how many hours after the game and no one's left. This is unbelievable. You were on that line with Brett Callaghan and that young kid in the middle. I think it was great that you taught Wayne Gretzky as much as you did. Man, well, I had to be one of the luckiest guys in hockey, right? To be able to play the first couple of years with Gretz. And uh, that first year, we were a little bit of underdogs. No one really knew too much about the team. We came into the league, and that first game here, I think the lead up, the buzz in the city, and uh, the warm up, and the electricity in that building in that first game and we were lucky enough to pull off a win against an original six team Detroit. It was just a great night. Well, you were part of it. Ladies and gentlemen, Blair, B.J. McDonald. Gene? John, uh, thanks very much. Well, as everybody knows, the Edmonton Oilers made a really big deal in 1988, a trade, a blockbuster, and it involved Bill Ranford, because uh, you came over from uh, the Boston Bruins, and as you came over, uh, I wonder what you were thinking about joining a team that had already had a large amount of success. Well, I, I was living in Red Deer, so I was a big Oilers fan, so it was a huge honor for me. And, uh, you know, it was a little overwhelming coming here with uh, the likes of Wayne Gretzky, Yari Curry, Glenn Anderson, Mark Messier, and, of course, the legendary Grant Fuhrer. So it was a real honor for me. I was excited about it. And, uh, you know, I spent 10 years here, and um, you know what? This is a big family here. This is just an incredible night. I, I, I'd just like to thank the Edmonton Honors organization for having me here. Uh, I'll never forget this. This is a, a lifetime moment right here. John? Before the National Hockey League were the Alberta Oilers and the Edmonton Oilers of the WHA and one of those original Oilers. Rusty Patino, I think the first order to score 100 goals in this jersey, am I right? I, I guess that's right. Uh, yeah. And without, without the WHA Oilers, there are no NHL Oilers and there are no Stanley Cups. So Rusty, you were part of something of a birth. What does that make you feel like as a longtime Oiler? Well, I, I just feel very fortunate to be a part of this organization. It's been a class organization right from Bill Hunter right through to today and I can see nothing but great things for the the Oilers in their new building and thing and I'm just proud to be part of them. Tell us about your career here. What did you like about playing in Edmonton? Well, you know what? Edmonton was a home that felt a uh, home away from home and people just endorsed you and the fans were so passionate. They just made you feel like you were something every night. Ladies and gentlemen, an original oiler, Rusty Patno. John, Ken Linsman was known for um, getting under the skin of opposing... Yeah, go ahead, give him a cheer.
Ken, what, what sort of qualities do, did you have and do players have to have when they're able to really kind of throw off the other team and, and maybe get to the point where they're more concerned about you than what, what else is going on the ice? I don't really know. It was just the way I played. <laughs> it's just natural. Came to you naturally? Do you remember anyone in particular or certain players that you were able to uh, bother a bit more than others? Not really. I just played. <laughs> just did it. <laughs> well, like you said, it came naturally. Uh, in 1984, or the year that you won the Stanley Cup with the Edmonton Oilers, uh, you scored three series clinching goals, including the one that clinched the Stanley Cup. Uh, what was that like for you? I was very lucky. I, you know, the, the goals weren't, uh, the game wasn't that close at the time. I think when I scored the game winner in the Stanley Cup game, it was, it was the third goal. We were 3-0 and ended up winning 5-2. But... Um, you know, I play with a great bunch of guys and uh, great people and very lucky. Ken, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Craig Muni won three Stanley Cups for the Edmonton Oilers. You live in Buffalo now. What's it like to come home to the City of Champions? Well, all you have to do is take a look around to tonight at the game at City Hall. It was like uh, winning the Stanley Cup all over again, coming back to Edmonton again. The, the defense you were on, there, I mean, there are some pretty big names. Obviously, Paul Coffey was a big part of the defense. But with all the firepower up front, you guys didn't get much credit for what you did for this team. What was that like, and what was it like to play with all these superstars? Well, they made the game very easy, that's for sure. Our main job was to get the puck up to them. But come every playoffs, uh, the defense as a core, we took that as a challenge to uh, outduel the other team's defense and show that we were capable of uh, helping out as much as we could. And what was it like to carry the cup around this rink in front of these people? As exciting as it was, I think the only thing that popped to my mind first was don't trip and don't drop the Stanley Cup in the rate of national television. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Muni. Well, for all the uh, great talent that uh, has been on the Edmonton Oilers there, I know they're not booing. Uh, they are looing. And when, what was it like for you when you kind of first heard the fans do that when you arrived in Edmonton? It was pretty remarkable. It was amazing, you know, and, and we've already heard guys talk about it. People, this is what it's all about right here, you know, coming to the Oilers and, you know, what they'd accomplished, what they'd done, stepping in that dressing room. I mean, um, they were the greatest franchise around, and everybody wanted to play for them. And these fans here, they're loud, they're passionate, and when they cheer your name, it's the best feeling in the world. Do you think it's something where the, the fans and the stands can really relate to the tough guys? Because in this city, the tough guys, they're like gold, right? As you can tell by the reception for you. Hey, blue collar, right? Listen, you know what? That's, uh, yeah. They've always loved it. They have, you know what? Uh, you look through the years and, and, and the players that played that way, played hard, played tough. I mean, that's what people love to see. But they also love their skill. And they, they had the greatest in the world that played here. and you know, led the way and some of the greatest that have ever played the game. Um, you know, but they certainly like that, that element of that style and rightfully so, I like it too. Lou, thank you. And uh, the way you talk, you maybe look forward to a, a role on TV at some point. I think that would work for you. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, Lou, thank you. Lou DeBrus. Well, it didn't win the Stanley Cup. Is there any more memorable goal than the first goal of Jordan Eberle at that end of the ice in this building? Tell me what that was like, and tell me what this is like. I mean, it's, it's amazing to be a part of this, obviously, all the Oilers coming back. Um, you know, for me, my first game, um, I think every player here probably remembers their first NHL game. I was uh, lucky enough to have my family and friends there, and, and, you know, I tell the story all the time. I would have been just as happy to tip it in or, or bank it off me or whatever, but, um, you know, Sean Horkoff gives it to me quite a bit about looking him off on a two-on-one, but, um, you know, it was great how it worked out. So, Jordan... The new building is one thing. This town's a, this is a real hockey community, and you played in Regina. You know, understand what it's like to play in a pure hockey town. When you, when you talk to former teammates and guys around the NHL, what it likes to what's it like to play in Edmonton? What can you tell them? 
Um, it, it is exactly what you said. It's a hockey town. Um, you know, you're going out for dinner, you're going out for lunch, you're meeting people that are season ticket holders, and you're talking to people um, about how much they love the game. And, and um, you know, I think a, a great example is that is Ryan Smith's last game. Um, just the fan support that they gave him, and, and to be a part of that was it was incredible. And that just sums up the fans here. Ladies and gentlemen, number 14, Jordan Eberle. They must think I need some protection from one tough guy. Uh, to another. I actually have not had a fight since grade five, so it has been uh, a long time. As I'm joined by uh, George Larock, and just continuing on the theme of uh, Louis DeBrusque and tough guys in this city, uh, how long did it take you to feel very comfortable as an Edmonton Oiler and an Edmontonian? You know, I have to thank the coaching staff a lot because uh, Ron Lowe, Kevin Lowe, Craig McTavish, uh, they make me work really hard to be uh, more of a just guy that would play two, two minutes a game so we could play hard, like hard-nosed uh, Oilers hockey, four lines. And thanks to the coaching staff, I got to develop a bit more. And I remember when I got into the dressing room when I was a rookie, I went to Sparky, our trainer, and I said I wanted number 27. And uh, I was putting a lot of pressure on my shoulder and uh, I don't know if I came up to even what uh, Dave has done to the city and to this team, but uh, it was an honor to wear the same number, uh, you know, in honor of him. Yeah, I must admit, uh, one of the neat moments uh, this morning is seeing you and Dave Semenko spend some time together. We'll, we'll talk about 2006 in a, in a few different uh, ways tonight, but when you look at these fans and you turn back the clock 10 years, uh, what do you remember about this building and that run? You know, um, truly we have the best fans in the world. Um, with Paul Laurel when he did the national anthems, you know when Paul Laurel did the national anthem, you guys picked it up, all the other teams copied us after, you guys started it. <laughs> I played in 14, Edmonton is the best team to play for, and a guy born in Montreal, Edmonton, I call it home now, this is home for me, I love you guys, you guys are amazing. Maybe one of the most important goals in Euler history wasn't scored in this rink, it was scored on Long Island at the Nassau Coliseum, Pat Hughes to Kevin McClellan, the Oilers win their first game of the 84 final, they slayed the demon that day, proving they could beat the New York Islanders. Pat, what do you tell your friends now about the goal, or what do you remember about this team and the team you played with? Well, that, you know, that was uh, our second uh, chance to, to get back at them from getting uh, um, beat for straight the year before. And, uh, you know, puck goes in the corner, kick it out, flip it over to Kevin, and uh, he picked the corner, uh, which was unlike him. But... Uh, <laughs> One nothing, and uh, we held on. It was a great start. To, uh, even though we lost the next night, we came back here and uh, handled them pretty well. So when you, you live in Michigan now, when you tell your friends in Michigan you won the Stanley Cup and you played in Edmonton and it was at Rexall, then Northlands, what's your first memory? Well, certainly the cup. I mean, uh, the first cup here was uh, electric for the city, electric for the team. Uh, you know, the whole city shared in it, the fans, and it's just a great event. Ladies and gentlemen, number 16, Pat Hughes. The first captain in the uh, Oilers history in the NHL, Ron Chipperfield. What, uh, what was it like for you to be the, the first captain of a franchise like this? Well, it was certainly an amazing honor. Um, I certainly wasn't expected. I, uh, I came to camp with all the guys, and I, I think it may have been the last ca captain vote that was put forward and the players voted for for me which again uh, was quite a surprise and quite an honor well I will say this Ron after you there are so many great captains what was it like to set the stage for the guys that followed in your footsteps and also wore the seat well um, three of the captains that came after me Wayne had already played one year in the WHA with us and then uh, Mark and Kevin came that first year, which they became the next uh, the captains further on. And so uh, I had the, the joy to watch these three young guys who I knew would all become not only great players, outstanding people, and 
certainly captains uh, of a team and an organization someday. Ron, thanks for your time. Thanks, Gene. Not many brother combinations played for the Edmonton Oilers. Bob McAnally, Ted McAnally. Not only did they play for the Oilers, they played for the Oil Kings as junior players in the late 60s. Bob, to you first. Explain what being an Oiler means to you now and what it meant to you in the mid-70s when you played in the WHA. Well, it was a thrill to come and play professional hockey. That was a dream of a kid like me from Prince George, B.C. All of a sudden, I was in Edmonton playing with the Oilers, playing against Bobby Hull. Of course, Bobby Hull was my idol, and what better memories of, of Bobby Hull and playing against him than seeing him streaking up the left side, slapping that shot, and those are great. You weren't supposed to watch it, you were supposed to stop it. I was checking him. <laughs> but great memories, and I've continued to stay in Edmonton after hockey, and uh, we, we've got a strong Oiler Alumni Association just getting stronger with the new young guys coming through. What was it like to play with your brother? Well, we played junior hockey with the Oil Kings for three years, and we had somewhat of a reputation, <laughs> but uh, it was good playing with him. Ted's a defenseman, I'm a left winger, and we were, very, we're twins, and it was, very, uh, it was a great experience playing pro hockey together. So, Ted, you can tell the truth. What was it like playing with your brother? <laughs> it was great. We, we had played since, uh, you know, we were five years old, and you know, to come and play junior hockey with the Edmonton Oil Kings. And, and then I left and uh, played uh, three years in the National League with the California Seals. And uh, Gretz hasn't, didn't, at that time, hadn't brought his magic to California, and so the fans didn't have the passion that they do down there now. So when I had an opportunity to come back to Edmonton and uh, play in front of the, the Edmonton fans who have the passion, and then step on this ice the first time and the energy and the electricity that the fans give to you what a thrill and then to of course play with Bob that was tremendous well welcome back for the night ladies and gentlemen Bob and Ted McAneely I think uh, as soon as you see him, you think uh, 2006 and uh, Fernando George Larocque touched on that run. What, what kind of sticks out for you, especially as a kid who grew up here and watched some of the people you're sitting with tonight and then being one of them on the ice? Yeah, I think uh, when we all sat down, I looked at Louie, I think we uh, were in the wrong spot here. <laughs> we got uh, pretty good company there with Gretzky, Messier and Curry and Anderson and all those guys. It's uh, being a kid from Edmonton, it's a pretty special feeling for me to be a part of this. Well, even all those names you mentioned would have been impressed. 14 goals, five game winners, uh, game five. Overtime, shorthanded. Um, that run for you, uh, is there any way to kind of put words to how great it was for the team and how great it was for you? Uh, it was such an exciting time for the city. Uh, every time we stepped on the ice, this place was just electric and so loud. And as soon as the trainers would open the doors to go out to the to the benches, you could just hear, you know, hear the excitement and feel it. And you just got butterflies in your stomach. It was uh, a pretty special feeling for me. Fernando, and a lot of special goals. Uh, congratulations on a great career with you, Oli. Thanks, Gene. Ladies and gentlemen, Stanley Cup champion Craig Simpson. So you have lived the life in this building as a player, as a coach, and as a broadcaster. What does the place mean to you? Uh, it's a very special place, and it starts with uh, coming here as a 20-year-old, uh, getting traded. I, I want to, first and foremost, I've said this to Paul numerous times, but Paul, thank you for holding out and not wanting uh, to get a deal done. Uh, I, I got an opportunity to come here to Edmonton because Paul Coffey uh, and Paul and I have a good history together. The greatest defenseman in the NHL, but he gave me an opportunity to come to a team that I, uh, I admired as a fan, I admired as a player. Got an opportunity as a 20 year old to come and play with Wayne Gretzky, who is my idol growing up. Uh, he was mine too, yeah, so. No, and. Um, 
And the most important thing, uh, Glenn Sather said to me day one, you're going to play with Mark Messier and Glenn Anderson. And uh, I said, oh, that's a great start. Uh, and I want to thank Mark and Glenn were the, the yeah. best line mates, the best teammates. Yeah. And uh, we, in front of fans like this, like tonight is a night that you look back on the past, but you also respect what you've done uh, as a group. 150 plus players here have all had different moments on this ice. Uh, some of us have been able to win. Fernando and the group in 2006 came so close, but it's about performing for these fans, and this is probably the most incredible time. Ladies and gentlemen, number 18, Craig Simpson. Well, as uh, these players could attest to, you build a, a franchise through uh, free agency, through the draft, through trades with Indianapolis, and sometimes you get guys from other teams who step in and think, you know, how will I fit? How will they accept me? How were you accepted by the Oilers? Well, you know, I, I came here from Pittsburgh where I think that the veterans weren't necessarily great to the rookies. There was almost there was concern about whether they were going to keep their jobs. And I walked into a locker room that is daunting because they'd won two Stanley Cups and it was full of great, great players. But I very, very quickly found out that they were greater people that the sense of community, the sense of family in that locker room was absolutely phenomenal. You know, right away, Wayne says, welcome to the team. Mark Messier said, you're not staying at the hotel, you're staying at my house. Koff says, if you need a car, I've got a car for you to drive till you get settled. And guys like Semenko and Randy Gregg and Lee Fogel and the strength of it, and even guys like Ace Bailey and Al Hamilton, the older guys that were still around and had a great influence. And Teddy Green was so good to me. I, it was a great environment for a young player to learn how to win, to, to learn how to compete, and have such a love for the game. Craig Simpson just alluded to you know, winning a Stanley Cup. You won two, 1987. Some of the younger fans may not remember, but as you win, you search out people that you know and you love. And you went looking for your father. Just walk us through when you decided to do that and what it was like to search him out and find him. Well, you know, the Oiler locker room has been so family friendly. The fathers, the kids, everybody was always so welcome around the hockey team, and they were really were proud of that scenario and my dad was too nervous to watch the games in the stands so he'd walk around this building underneath the stands so when we won and they opened the door and rolled out the carpet and I'm almost lost because we you win a Stanley Cup and it's just bigger than life and there's my dad and when he walked out on the ice I just gave him a great big hug and said we got our name on the Stanley Cup so it was just it was just an extension of the of the team Great moment, great story, Marty. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, G. Ron Chipperfield, we were, it was great to hear him, the captain of the Oilers when they joined the National Hockey League, got traded that season to, to Quebec for a goaltender. Anybody you know? <laughs> Best day of my life, John. Best day of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Lowe. It was really funny because Chipper and I played on the same team in Manitoba and when he got traded to where I was coming from, I felt for him, but felt really good for me. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's give and take. So you, you, that first year you came here, the team made the playoffs, lost in the first round of the Flyers. I think Kenny Linsman scored the winning goal for the Flyers that night in game three here. But tell, tell us what it meant to be a player early in the Coliseum and for the Oilers in the NHL and then to go to become a coach. How, how, how much different was it? The playing, I wasn't good enough to contribute to the Stanley Cups. Uh, sorry, they had Fierzy, Moger, they had Billy Ranford. There was a whole bunch of guys that were a whole bunch better than me. And that was good because we wouldn't have won if I was playing. But I want to tell you, I had lots to do with all of them, and they were the neatest bunch of guys. Uh, the the goaltending that they've had here has been so good, and the people that got to watch the great players also got to watch some great goaltenders. And to me, that was one of the big things. That One of the reasons that this group won every year, because at some points in time, the defensive game lapsed a wee bit, I don't know if you ever noticed that. Once in a while. But their goaltending was phenomenal. 
So the, the other thing we had, I think we have to talk about, there was a rite of spring in the 90s when you were the coach of playing the Dallas Stars in the first round of the playoffs, or one of those rounds of the playoffs, and the Todd Marchant goal in game seven in reunion. You know what? The thing I remember most about that whole series was game four here, I think, no, game five. We're down 3-1, and we're down 3-1 in the game. And the place was emptying out late 10 minutes into the third. They said it was a U-turn on Capilano. Because <laughs> all of a sudden we scored, we scored, and we scored again. And then Bucky gets the overtime winner. This whole place was full at the end of the night again. And I'll never forget that, and I appreciate everybody that came back. Ladies and gentlemen, player, coach, Ron Lowe. Thanks, Ron. Well, lots of talk about the past and uh, talk about present and futures. I'm joined by Taylor Hall and... Uh, How'd you feel about that game? It was more a, a relief than anything. Um, the guys really wanted to play well for the last game here. Um, with everyone here, uh, all the legends in town, it was a really fun night. What was the atmosphere like with the fans and the stick salute at the end and the standing ovation and just how that felt to kind of send your team off to the end of the season and to the end of this building? Yeah, it was amazing. Right off the bat in warm-up, you could tell there was electricity in the building. Um, even just walking out here now, everyone's still in their seats. Everyone's glued in. It's, um, it's amazing. That's what Edmonton's all about. And uh, getting here six years ago, getting here six years ago and, and seeing what this town, you know, how much they love hockey, uh, playing in an arena where all of these great players have played, uh, it's been a fun journey. Taylor, thank you. Enjoy the offseason. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the coach of the Edmonton Oilers, Todd McClellan. Before we talk about you and your team in this city, tell us about what it was like to come here as a visiting coach. 2006, you were on the bench for the Red Wings, Steve Eiserman's last game in the National Hockey League. You were an assistant coach for the Red Wings that the Oilers beat in the first round to go all the way to the Stanley Cup final that year. What was it like in this building? It was loud, it was exciting, uh, the building was shaking, and we were disappointed. Edmonton did one hell of a job, and that's what we're hoping to get to eventually. So, the game's been over for about an hour, and if I would have told you this summer before you got the job, when we're going to close the building, we're going to have 18,000 people sitting around for an hour, an hour and a half, just sitting, listening to people tell stories about this great franchise, what would you have told me? I actually would have believed it. Um, you know, being from Western Canada, I know what it's like here in Edmonton and, and knew what to expect coming in. This is very humbling uh, when you look around at the players that have come back and, and returned to their home, Edmonton and honored the Oilers, uh, the different generations, and, and uh, I said to the media tonight, their presence, just their presence alone, held us accountable tonight, as well as the 18,000 people that show, ev show up every night, so we appreciate it. Well, you're an Oiler now. Absolutely. It's just waiting. Now, let's stop it before he starts crying, okay? Because we've seen that before. Uh, we've seen tears of joy, tears of sadness, but more tears of joy because you came back to Edmonton. Uh, I mean, what do you think of that response? Does it ever kind of go, wow, that's for me? Yeah, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's very humbling. Um, 
in many different occasions that it's occurred along my journey uh, being a part of the Edmonton Oilers organization. I want to start by saying this is first class, right from Daryl Cates to uh, Kevin Lowe and and uh, Bob Nicholson and orchestrating and all this. It's it's uh, it's a great night for not only myself, my family, but all these guys here. And uh, hopefully, it uh, you'll remember these forever for sure. Well, we've discussed 2006 uh, a number of times. I, I want to talk about a memory. Uh, not, I think you were just behind me. Was it not when you took the the puck in the teeth from Chris Pronger? You you go away, you come back, and you set up the OT winner by Sean Hawkup. What what was that like? Did you ever consider not coming back? And I'm guessing the answer was no. Well, I was very fortunate to have great trainers for sure to uh, help out on that front. Um, I didn't have nerve exposure, so that. Uh, I didn't have to go to the hospital for all that dental work, but uh, um, the story behind it all is those, those doors were closed uh, between the, the, um, the benches on the way down, and I was so upset and mad, I pushed those doors open, and there was an usherette lady in behind there, I ended up hearing that she broke her wrist. <laughs> so a couple days later, we ended up obviously winning that hockey game, uh, Sean Horkoff, uh, a double overtime winner. Sorry, Todd. Um, but I wanted to make sure that she got her cast autograph, so I got that all taken care of. That actually seems like a fair trade. You know, broken wrist signature from Ryan Smith. Um, you, you broke the wrist, but I also saw you with a broken heart. Uh, I, I've seen lots of different athletes. Game seven, Carolina, you, you guys, Fernando talked about it, George talked about it. You guys gave everything you could, and I saw you walk off the ice in tears. Can you just give us an idea how badly you wanted that Stanley Cup for you, for these fans, for this city and franchise? Well, the city in itself speaks for how much they support the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, going that, that full distance and coming up short, uh, it's so... You know, it's a tough pill to swallow. I don't live in regret. There's a loss of not winning the Stanley Cup. But at the end of the day, we went as far as we could, and we did as best as we could, and it was a journey that I'll never forget. Long before the banners of Wayne and Yari and Grant and Glenn went up, went the first banner, and the number three of Al Hamilton of the WHA. Edmonton Oilers. When he came out of junior hockey, he was known as Bobby Orr of the West, if I'm not correct. I think that's the right story, out of Winnipeg. And in many ways, the franchise, the Oiler franchise then, was on the back of Al Hamilton, some of the great players of the WHA. There would be no NHL team without guys like Al Hamilton here in the WHA. What does that make you feel, Al? Well, I'm quite... When I first heard about the WHA forming, I wasn't really excited about, uh, I was excited about Edmonton getting a team, but I wasn't excited about coming back because I thought this is another one of Bill Hunter's schemes. <laughs> but uh, it turned out to be a wonderful experience. I got to, to play the seven years in the WHA and then played the first year with the Oilers and played with great players like Gretz and Mess and, and Kevin and so, uh, and, and see the start of it. Edmonton has been home for me for, for all these years and uh, it's a great, great city and, and these kids when they learn now what winning is about in this town, they'll know what love is. So tell us that first year and you saw 99 on the ice as a teenager, you're the old vet, did you know right away? Well yeah, it wasn't too hard to tell. I'll tell you one little story, we, Wayne, Wayne had uh, in the first year of the NHL, Wayne had seven assists in the game and I passed him the puck and he mesmerized everybody on the ice and drew them all over to one side and including their goaltender and slid it to me. If I put it in the net, it's a, it's a record. I missed the net by 15 feet. <laughs> Sorry, Gretz. Ladies and gentlemen, number three, Al Hamilton. Anybody who's ever worn the Oilers jersey feels uh, a great sense of pride, but uh, Grant, does it mean even a little bit more considering you grew up uh, right in the Edmonton area and you were 
growing up here watching the Oilers and then one day being one? I think that's a special time. I mean, I got the opportunity to watch a lot of these guys play in the WHA, the old Edmonton Gardens. So to see them play there and want to be an Oiler as a kid and to be able to do it at home, it's a great deal. I was walking over here tonight and I was thinking about uh, some of the things you said over the, the years that you were here. And Now, did, did Glenn make you run the stairs here? All of them, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what was the point he was trying to prove? Uh, we were having a little discussion about shape and training camp, yeah. so... <laughs> Apparently round's not a shape. <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was looking through the stats, and one year you had 14 assists and you were a goaltender. Uh, you had a, a run-and-gun offense. Uh, what was it like to be that last line of defense and making those big saves, whether the score was 6-4 or 7-5, making sure the other team didn't get one closer? You know what? We had such a great group of guys that, yeah, we won a lot of games, 7-3, 7-4, but if they had to bear down and play good defense, we could win one nothing also. So I think we had a reputation as a run-and-gun team, but if you looked at our record come playoff time, we could win the close games. Yeah, biggest win was a one nothing to get the franchise off and running. Grant, thank you. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Gene. So I was going to mention the 14 assists for Grant as well, simply because the opposition would shoot the puck, Grant would stop it, put it behind the net and give it to Paul, and then Paul would skate all the way up the ice and score. It was an easy thing to do, right? Caught 49 goals one year. Well, it wasn't easy, but the easiest part was to uh, get the puck from Grant, skate up and give it to Wayne, Mark, Yari, or Glenn. That's what a smart defenseman does, gives it to good forwards, and uh, we had plenty of them and it made it a lot easier. What do you remember about this building and what do you remember about these people? I just remember this town being, you know, I came here as an 18, 19 year old with Mark and Wayne and Yari and and Fierzy came the next year and Glenn, but it, it was a town of character. I mean, you can talk all you want about this team having Gretzky, Messi, Anderson, Curry and guys like that, but you know, what made this team champions were the role players, the Semenkos, the Hunters, the McClellans, the McSorleys, you know, Dave, uh, Dave Lumley, guys like that that allowed us to have fun and go out and play the way we did, and that's why we were champions. Ladies and gentlemen, number seven, Hall of Famer, Paul Coffey. Well, John, we had just talked to Grant Fuhr about uh, 14 assists in a season. Now, was there more to the story about Grant and assists? Well, yeah, there's a lot more to, uh, especially climbing the stairs uh, with the uh, big sweat bag on and running up. We were watching them there a couple of times, but. The real key thing was uh, it was a, a battle for who was going to get the most points that year between Semenk and Fierzy on, on, on the assist list because Semenk got the score. <laughs> Here you are joking with Grant, you're joking with Dave, and the decades go by, but does it feel like it's still, you know, the 80s when it comes to just how tight-knit group you guys are and still are after all these decades? Well, the threshold over there, once you walk through those doors, there's a you better have a rhinoceros skin because uh, there's a lot of darts that were thrown around and Koff was very good at it. So uh, he could throw with the best of them and uh, the comments that came out of it, that, that's what made our, our team so tight and so uh, close because we could say and do anything and once we were a team through that, uh, through that path right there, it, uh, it, everything, any problems outside of the rink, they all disappeared and uh, we played for each other in the town of Edmonton. Glenn, thanks, and good to see you again. Okay, thanks, Gene. For Edmonton Oilers fans, the most iconic call of them all came at the end of the deciding game in the 1984 Stanley Cup when the upstart Oilers, in their fifth year in the NHL, achieved the incredible. Watch the screen. There's a new punch on the block in the National Hockey League. The Edmonton Oilers have won the Stanley Cup. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the author of that call, the Dean of NHL Broadcasters, Mr. Bob Cole. Come on out, Bob. So, Bob, tell us why and how the new bunch on the block came about. I'm not quite sure, John, but uh, I, I kind of fell in love with this group. <laughs> these young Oilers in uh, 83 when they got all the way to the Stanley Cup final in Long Island 
That was a dynasty with the Islanders, and they lost in four games. And I remember walking out with, with Wayne and Glenn and Paul and all the guys, and everybody was just in silence, just walking and bruised and tired and worn out. And then the next year, I lived through it and, and really fell in love with this team. They made me feel so comfortable. And we, we got together again, as everybody knows, the next year in 84, and they won their first Stanley Cup. The first of four here in this old building, which we're saying goodbye to tonight. And uh, it, it just happened, a new bunch on the block. Sometimes you're wrong, but I was right. New bunch. Wayne, you've had uh, great friendships with many announcers over the years. I remember when you first met Danny Gallivan, but your time with Bob, even that closing game at Madison Square Garden in 1999, the hug yeah. in the hallway, and what Bob means to you in this franchise. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for a wonderful night. The Oilers and uh, all the players who came back, and of course the fans. I, I, Mark and I were talking, I don't think there's any other city where the fans would still be sitting here. Uh, my gosh, we wish we could get out there and play for them, but we're, we can't do that anymore. Uh, one, one quick question. When you, when you signed your 21-year contract, I think it was in one of the corners on a card table here when you were in the WHA, did you ever imagine that this would occur? Uh, two people said it would happen. Glenn Sather, my dad, and Vic Ma. Those three people said, we're going to win Stanley Cups in Edmonton. Mark Messe and Kevin Lowe and Paul Coffey and to me, the greatest goalie ever lived, Grant Fuhrer and Glenn Anderson. Uh, but, but back to Mr. Cole, uh, my two favorite moments is the new kids on the block and when he said to Team Canada, that's got to be enough. <laughs> that was the most joyous time for me. But, you know, we grew up as fans. Mark was sitting here telling me today they used to take the bus to watch Rusty Patino play. We're kids, too, with dreams, and everybody should have their dreams. We grew up watching Danny Gallivan and Dick Irvin and Foster Hewitt and Mr. Cole. I try to call him every couple of weeks to see how he's doing. Sometimes the phone calls don't get through to Newfoundland, but all in all, uh, the greatest thing about hockey is the people you meet. My life, uh, the people I've met, my family, my wife, my kids, the friendships I have, our memories, it's nothing like it. It's the greatest game in the world. And Mark, uh, just continuing on the theme of uh, Mr. Cole, the Hockey Hall of Famer, somewhere you're certainly familiar with. There, were there certain, uh, Wayne just talked about certain calls, were there, um, the announce of Moose call we're getting, I guess, hey? Were there specific calls, or just was it something special to know that Bob Cole would have called a, a Stanley Cup winning or a playoff winning series uh, goal? You knew you were in the big leagues, you knew you were in the moment, you knew that uh, you are at the end of the line and playing for the championship when Bob was around. It was, uh, it was a special moment and uh, we'll never forget, obviously, uh, for all the obvious reasons winning the Stanley Cup, but then you put all the people that make magic happen and bring it to the people there and nobody did it better than Bob. And still continues to do it as you did tonight, Bob. What a, what a great call you had of the, uh, kind of the, the, the new, new kids. Uh, on the on the block when it comes to the current uh, Edmonton Oilers For you Wayne just describe some of the things it took to be successful Can you kind of maybe continue on that theme or add to that when it came to the the group the family the dynasty that was uh, built in this uh, You know northern city with blue-collar people uh, blue-collar hockey players and then some some gems as well well, I think it's, it's very simple. No individual can win a championship on his own. I mean, it's just that simple. You need a lot of support. You need a lot of people thinking the same way, uh, all in alignment. Uh, you need the heart and dedication and the character to, uh, to make it happen. And, uh, you know, we realize that, uh, like I said today at City Hall, when you win, the stage is big enough for everybody. You've got to make everybody feel that their contributions are just as important as the next guys, no matter whether it's 30 minutes a game or two minutes a game everybody's got to feel that they're important and if they don't bring their best every game you have zero chance of winning there and we were able to convince everybody that came here 
that they were important and we needed you. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Cole, Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier. It's a great privilege to introduce him. His contributions to this community, to the game of hockey, are literally impossible to include in a brief introduction. He was the first Oilers draft pick. He played on five Stanley Cups, six if you count the Oilers farm team in New York. He pioneered the Oilers players' commitment to the community when he shared the Christmas Bureau campaign, the most incredible campaign, and it continues to this day. He was a head coach of the Oilers, the general manager of the Oilers, was involved many times on the international hockey stage and is now the vice chairman of the Oilers Entertainment Group. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Lowe. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for everyone for sticking around. It's made us feel special. It's my honor on behalf of the Oilers Entertainment Group to welcome everyone here to Rexall Place, or as many of you remember it throughout the years, Northlands Coliseum. A big thank you to Mr. Bob Nicholson for all your support and for giving me the honor of speaking on behalf of the organization tonight. Let's give a big round of applause for the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. So great to have them here. We have a saying, once an oiler, always an oiler. And you guys have made it special. Thank you to the Northlands, all the great staff, over the many years. You helped bring this building to life, game in, game out, and you made it a great, great experience for the players and for the fans. Thank you, Northlands. And a special thanks to our amazing Oilers staff, now Oilers Entertainment Group, past and present. Your passion, commitment, and love of the team has always been the foundation and the success of this organization. Thank you. And most importantly, last, not, last but not least, thank you to the fans. You showed time and again, again this afternoon at Churchill Square and here tonight, that you're the greatest fans in all of hockey. And you've made a special all these years for us. There is some sadness saying goodbye to what's been our home for 42 years. But we're tremendously excited about the future and Rogers Place and our new downtown arena. But it's bittersweet, a bittersweet night for all of us who played here and made so many great friendships and made so many memories over the years. So without further ado, it's now my pr privilege to call upon our banner honorees to go over and uh, get in position to receive this special banner commemorating the 42-year history of the Oilers in Rexall Place. Wayne, Mark, Al, Grant, Yari, Paul, and Andy. And here to assist the transfer of the banner are two longtime Northlands employees. Currently in his 36th year with Northlands, please say hello to Chris Lewis. And after spending 18 years on Northlands Ice Crew and now his 31st year with Northlands, please say hello to George Wazalanchuk. And of course, we can't say goodbye to this building without bringing out one last individual. Ladies and gentlemen, Joey Moss.
just came out here and did our business because it was a passion we had. And we were embraced by a community that uh, we all fell in love with. And that's why everyone who's in weather always calls Edmonton home. Oilers fans with sincere appreciation for your endless passion and support all these years. One last time here at Rexall Place, your Edmonton Oilers!